How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully for me. This is from the 13th Psalm. And as we begin our midday Bible study here, what we're going to be looking at this week are the lament psalms or psalms of lament. Psalms of lament take up about 60% of all of the psalms found in the Bible. And they're an important part of how we learn to relate to God. So before I jump into this psalm in particular today, I want to give a few introductory remarks. First, why, why do this study now? Well, because we are not the kind of people who pretend that everything is okay. Everything is not okay. That's what the Psalms of Lament teach us. Everything is not okay. The world is not working the way it ought to. I, I, I feel pretty compelled by this. Um, as I've sat with it and with the Lord in prayer, and as I've observed people, I've seen stuff on social media. Maybe some of you have seen this. Maybe some of you even posted it. Uh, I've seen churches put up signs throughout their community about this. That, and the saying literally is, everything is gonna be okay. The Psalms, the Lament Psalms teach us that that is not the appropriate way to speak both of our current situation, of the way things are going, nor the appropriate way to speak of God and how he relates to the world. The Psalms of Lament teach us to say that everything is not okay. They teach us that when somebody is suffering and in pain, to tell them everything is going to be okay can be a giving them false hope, false security. Teach saying that everything is okay can be heard as an insult to those who are suffering and in pain. To, it can be heard and received as, then, then what do I do with all of my pain? You see, we are not the kind of people who repress, avoid, or ignore real pain and suffering, but rather we learn to metabolize it through prayer. In other words, lament is, the kind of, is a kind of food for the suffering soul. Lament these psalms as we walk through them, you're going to see they can be incredibly jarring. They can make us uncomfortable in how they speak about God and how they speak about our own situation as a person pours out their complaints to God. And so I want to give us four reasons why we should pray this way. First and foremost, because Jesus did. Jesus prays this way. Jesus hanging from the cross prays in a lament psalm, Psalm 22, and cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He takes up this cry of suffering and pain himself. He prays Psalm 69, another very well-known and profound psalm of lament. Jesus himself prayed this way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way. He says, a psalm that we cannot utter as a prayer that makes us falter and horrifies us is a hint to us that here someone else is praying, not we. That the one who is here protesting his innocent, who is invoking God's judgment, who has come to such infinite depths of suffering is none other than Jesus Christ himself. He it is who is praying here, and not only here, but in the whole Psalter. Here, Dietrich Bonhoeffer meditating on Luke 24, teaching about how all the, even the Psalms talk about him and speak of him. And because the fact that Jesus is the one who's praying the Psalms, we learn, Bonhoeffer concludes, that the one who prays the Psalms never prays alone. We pray these because Jesus prays. We secondly pray these because they keep us from a hypocritical faith. A hypocritical faith that always pretends that everything is okay in the face of suffering and pain. That we are not the kind of people who pretend that everything is okay when it's not. This is a kind of hypocrisy, a putting on of a, a false self, the putting on of a face or a front that is not true of the heart's condition. And we are not those kinds of people and lament psalms prevent us from becoming those kinds of people. 
Walter Brueggemann famously said this, I think that serious religious use of lament psalms has been minimal because we have believed that faith does not mean the acknowledgement of negativity. We have come to be the kind of people who believe that if I really believe in God, then I won't acknowledge any pain or suffering. And what the Psalms of Lament do is actually teach us the opposite, that we are to have a non-hypocritical faith, a faith that doesn't pretend, a faith that doesn't just kind of passively resign and say, everything's going to be okay but rather engages God intentionally and actively by stating one's true condition before God. They keep us from a, from a hypocritical faith. They also keep us from maintaining the status quo. In other words, lament psalms call evil evil. It names evil and exposes it. It doesn't pretend as if it isn't there. It doesn't allow the voice of the afflicted to go unheard. The Psalms of Lament raise the pitch and the tone and the volume of the afflicted so that it cannot, by those who are oppressing and those in power, cannot avoid or resist or refuse the voice of the afflicted. And it raises it all the way to the heavens. Psalms of Lament keep us from maintaining this status quo. It faces us to, forces us to reckon with the suffering and the afflicted and the oppressed. And finally, it keeps us from saying false things about God. It helps us to avoid bad theology. God, as Walter Brueggemann said, is not the silent guarantor of the status quo, but rather God can be addressed in risky ways as the transformer of what has not yet appeared. As the transformer of what has not yet appeared. God isn't just sitting up there passively in heaven, letting things go as like the blind watchmaker who wound up the world and lets it go according to some some kind of blind plan, but rather God is the one who allows himself to be engaged and addressed. God is in the Psalms of Lament induced to move on behalf of the oppressed and the afflicted and the brokenhearted. The God of Jesus Christ, the God of the Psalms, is precisely that God who makes himself available and movable by the prayers of the suffering. This is what the Psalms of Lament teach us, and they invite us to pray this way. So let's look at Psalm 13. Psalm 13 is a short psalm. It's a prototypical lament psalm. It kind of gives us the basic layout of the way most lament psalms work. So that what you can see there's three stanzas, verses one and two, verses three and four, and verses five and six. So let's look at this psalm together. Stanza one, that is verses one and two, begins with an interrogation of God and his character. And it, this interrogation comes in the form of four questions. And these four questions have this sort of force of, God, I want an answer. And, they're, and the psalmist interrogates God. How long, O oh Lord, how long is going to be the form of each one of these questions? How long first will you forget me forever? How long will you forget me forever? There's this kind of impatience in prayer. The one who is suffering appeals to the one who does not suffer, God himself, and says, I'm the one who's suffering here. There's a kind of recognition of a kind of distance that God exists in a kind of place where he doesn't suffer. And so the psalmist appeals to his own situation and condition and asks and invokes and interrogates God. You're not the one who's suffering here, I am. And it, it, it has this idea, especially for those of us who have suffered greatly in our lives, this idea that um, when we're suffering, it feels like we've been suffering forever. This sort of eternal moment of pain. And the, the implied accent of this question is, an accusation against God's character. He's not doing anything, an accusation against particularly his compassion, that God does not see or recognize the suffering. How long are you not going to do anything about this? The second how long question, will you hide your face forever? This now is an implied accusation of God's abandonment. The turning away of one's faith, face is the avoiding of the situation. And there's an implied accusation here. Are you avoiding me, God? Are you abandoning me, God? Then the third interrogation. 
How long must I take counsel in my soul? How long must I take counsel in my own soul? In other words, what's happening here to the psalmist is there's an implied accusation of God's unwillingness to help, to advise, to give counsel. And so the psalmist is wondering, do I need to turn inward now and just find my own inner resources, my own counsel to deal with this problem? Because God seems like he's not available to help. And the fourth inter interrogation, how long shall my enemies be exalted over me? This is a sting, stinging indictment. God is not the one who is exalted, but the enemy is the one who is exalted. When the sufferer looks up, the one that he sees is his enemy. The one that he sees is his enemy. The enemy in the Psalms uh, can mean many different things. It can mean a false accuser, the one that's saying you're suffering because of your sin. It can be a persecutor, the one who is taking advantage of the sufferer. It can be a taunt. It could be meant as a taunt that you have no good reason to maintain your faith. Your faith is fragile. Your trust in God is foolish. The enemy stands in a kind of general sense throughout the Psalms and can be used in many different ways. But the enemy standing over the sufferer, taunting the sufferer, accusing the sufferer. And that's, that's the one who the psalmist says is exalted over him. So that's the first stanza. And as we can see in that first stanza, there's a jarring, it's almost uncomfortable the way the psalmist talks about God. It makes us feel as if, wow, I don't know if I could feel comfortable talking to God that way. And we're, we're meant to feel that. We're meant to be invited to begin to pray this way. Stanza number two is gonna be a turn. Instead of abandoning God and turning finally inward to my own counsel, and the counsel of one's own soul, as he says in verse two, the psalmist is going to turn out and is gonna plead with God to consider the situation. As we see in Psalm 13, verse three, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Consider and answer me, O Lord. So instead of me, the one taking consideration in my own soul, the psalmist turns out to God and says, God, you consider my situation. You take account of my situation. You look at this situation. And this is gonna be a major theme throughout all of the lament psalms. Bruce Waltke, a great Old Testament scholar, said this, by turning to God in distress and addressing him, the petitioner shows his complete dependence upon God. To look elsewhere for deliverance would be tantamount to idolatry. And so the psalmist in the laments is going to turn to God in prayer instead of turning to something else, like to wealth, to power, to notoriety, to other gods, the psalmist, even in his accusations, even in his interrogation of God's character, is still turning to God. Even admitting a lack of faith in prayer is itself an act of faith. Death is a very real possibility. The enemy takes it as a form of, the enemy looks at this person's death as a kind of vindication. I was right about you. And death can be a proof that one's person, a person's faith has been in vain. And it would be used as an excuse by the wicked to endorse their own views and judgments that their way of life was right. So you're going to die anyway, so you might as well live the way I'm going to live. And this is why the psalmist pleads with God to light up my eyes, wake in me. This is a hope in the God of resurrection. And then we see it finally in the last stanza, verses 5 and 6, an affirmation of trust. It's a seemingly abrupt move. God has replaced the enemy now as the one who is over him in verse 6. The translation is God has dealt bountifully over me. It would be the correct translation there. Uh, this is a statement of a theological reality. Martin Luther said this is a statement which hope despairs and yet despair hopes at the same time. Paul said it this way. We are a people who are sorrowful yet always rejoicing or a people who rejoice in our sufferings. These two things coexist together because we are a people of faith. Faith that even though we look at our circumstances, we can see beyond them. We can't see currently the bounty, the deliverance, the love, but by faith we believe that they are coming, that God will be the God of salvation. God is the God of steadfast love. God is the God who will deal bountifully for us. We do not walk by what we can see, but we walk by faith. And that's the promise of the Psalms of Lament.